talk uh, about, go the message from First Timothy chapter one verses one through eleven. It's about false teaching. I mean, there's some false teaching out there in Christianity today, and Paul had to deal with it. We got to deal with it, and and we're going to look at First uh, Timothy chapter one. So if you want to turn to your Bibles, First Timothy chapter one, the Bible quizzing material this next year is on 1st and 2nd Timothy, and I know that all the young people that are thinking about Bible quiz and remember to bring their notepads this morning. Sure. Oh, we got a couple. Okay, good deal. All right, 1st Timothy chapter 1 and verses 1 through 11. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urge you upon my departure for Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. Verse 5, this is a key verse right here. You might want But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. For some men straying from these things have turned aside the fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters by which they make confident assertions. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that the law is not made for the righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, and for the unholy and profane, and those who kill their fathers or mothers or for murderers, and immoral men, and homosexuals, and kidnappers, and liars, and perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have entrusted. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. And even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than the abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. And it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am for most of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost Jesus Christ might demonstrate His perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in Him for eternal life. And I know verse 17 is going to be a quote. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This command I entrust you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping the faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. And among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. How many remember the story about Little Red Riding Hood. And who was the bad guy in the story? The wolf. The wolf. The gray wolf and the, or the, uh, is known as the timber wolf. The western wolf is a canine native to the wilderness, remote areas of North America. The gray wolf is one of the world's best known, most researched animals. Probably more books have been written about any other wildlife species than this. It's a long history of associating with humans having been despised and hunted in most communities because of its attacks on livestock, while conversely being respected in some societies. There is a fear of wolves in many societies. 
because of the attack on people. Now, most often when they attack people, it's because they're rabid, but sometimes they still attack people, and they have killed people, mainly children, uh, but that's rare. But wolves generally live far away from people and have developed a fear of humans from hunters and, and shepherds and the, and the alike. That's from the dictionary. Several years ago, I used this illustration of in, up in Alaska, in order to kill the wolves, they would go out, uh, they'd take a really, really sharp knife, and they'd code that knife with blood, frozen blood, and they'd stick it up in the snow, and they'd coat it with blood, and, and then the wolf would come, and he'd begin to lick on the blood. And pretty soon, as he was licking on that really sharp knife, the wolf's blood would intermingle with the blood on the knife, and eventually the wolf would be killed because of the loss of blood. Interesting story. Here Paul is writing to Timothy, his son in the faith, uh, to warn him against the wolves in the church. Wolves have entered the church, and Paul writes to correct some of these errors uh, that they're promoting. It's interesting that the two places that, that Paul spent the most time in his ministry and on his missionary travels, Corinth and Ephesus, those two churches seem to be the ones that had the most problems. Really. Certainly he spent a lot of time writing to correct the errors. Uh, they're being introduced by certain people. And, and uh, you know, we really shouldn't be surprised because heirs continually to come into the church all the time. I mean, there's things like universal salvation. You know, everybody's going to be... God's not a God that would, would punish anybody. Eventually, everybody's going to find a path to God, right? I mean, you know, if we, we watch Oprah... Winfrey, and we, we study the wheel and the spokes, and all these different religions, Hinduism and, and Buddhism and Islam, they, they all lead to the, the same thing, right? And someday everybody is going to be saved. Well, that, I want to tell you, that's a false teaching that has crept into the church. And there's many more false teachings. So on his visit to, to them, Paul warned the Ephesian elders to look out for the opposition. Because just as soon as he left, the wolves would be coming in. Let me read what he had to say uh, to the el uh, elders at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, verse 28 through 31. He wrote this, I know that after I have gone, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Some even from your own group will come distorting the truth in order to entice the disciples to follow them. Therefore, be alert. Everybody alert? Say, say alert. alert. Everybody's alert, right? Be alert. Remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to warn everyone with tears. Now it seems that those wolves did indeed come to the church at Ephesus. And so Paul writes them addressing five main topics. And there's also the letter specifically to the church of Ephesus. But this is a letter that's written to Timothy, who is the son in the faith of... Paul thinks of him as his son in the faith, and he wants him to take over the leadership so these five main topics in, these, in this letter, what Christians believe, what we should believe, how we should conduct worship, and who should be leaders in the church, and how to handle social responsibilities, and what our attitude should be to material possessions. Now the background of the church, if you know anything about Asia Minor, you know the false doctrine, the teachings, of the, uh, there was a strong affiliation with Artemis or Diana, the goddess of hunt and fertility, and they, they had uh, male prostitute temples. They worshipped. And the temple of Artemis in Ephesus was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and the population was proud of their goddess. And, uh, but there's a general context of the culture where their authority and influence came. You had to be old. A young person 
uh, was not as respected as someone who was older. So the, there was wisdom, in, and there really is wisdom. But this was one of the things that Timothy battled against because he was a young man pastoring this church. And one of the things we discover as we go through the letter is that the church is central to Paul's thinking. He's thinking about the care of the church. Weeping over the church. Uh, can you see why that is? It's because the church is the visible messenger of the gospel of Jesus Christ and of the kingdom of God. It is the light that was in that dark world of, of paganism, uh, idol worship in Asia Minor. So let's look at the, the first seven verses. He begins his usual style. Now he announces who he is. We know who he is, right? Now, who he is, describing uh, who is the recipient of this letter, reminding the readers uh, of the source of all they have. And, and so we jump into this, and it's really significant how he describes himself. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God. Notice the commandment of God. In some circles, Paul was, being, was discredited uh, as not a, an apostle. And of course he believed because of his experience on the road to Damascus and that according, uh, he was an apostle of Christ Jesus. It was Jesus that he met on the, through that bright light that spoke to him and caused him to go blind. According uh, to the commandment of God, the command of God, our Savior and our Christ Jesus who is our hope. And so he believed that he uh, was a, a special apostle. And so he announces himself, he describes himself, not as just any apostle, but an apostle of Jesus Christ. Not just a, a missionary that was sent out, but he was an apostle of Jesus Christ, chosen and appointed and authorized uh, directly by Christ and our hope by our God and our Savior. In verse 1, he says uh, the term by command, that he was by commandment. Uh, and so this was official. And uh, he speaks as one authorized by God himself. And he also addresses Timothy as my true child in the faith. And that is translated as someone very loyal. Uh, uh, someone that was like a legitimate child. And it's as though Paul wants to pass on to Timothy this authority that he has, referring to him as a genuine uh, child of the Apostle Paul. So Paul, of course, was uh, responsible for his, his conversion. He was there. He saw him grow and, and mature and become this young man in Christ. And he saw him as a spiritual son of faith. And, and there are those that I have felt very kin to because I saw them grow and mature in the faith. I might have had something to do uh, as an influence to them. And maybe some of you. There's somebody, I know Jetty taught Sunday school many years and youth group and, and uh, for her, uh, some of you might be some of her sons in the faith. And I went, no, Wendy's got a lot of sons in the faith. And Melissa and other teachers that are, that are out there, they're true uh, sons of, their, the, of the faith. And so Timothy was special in the sense that he was a young man, probably in his mid to late 30s, maybe even a little bit younger than this. And uh, he was asked by Paul to lead this church. How many of you feel like you're shy a little bit? Raise your hand. Okay, the, the shy ones are not going to raise their hand, are they? No. Okay. No shy person is going to raise your hand. And I want you to come out of yourself right now. This is the moment that you come out of your shyness and raise your hand if you consider yourself a shy person. I see some that are telling me the truth, but there's those. They're just too shy to even say that they're shy. And so, anyway. Paul, uh, Timothy was kind of a, a really shy individual. 
and like maybe some of you, and he had never been put in a leadership position, so this is a little bit uncomfortable for him uh, to be leading the church over some older ones. And I remember when I first came to McGinney Town, and uh, I heard several times, he's just a kid. He's just a kid. I remember the ladies from Little Rock that came up. We had a mystery dinner in the back of the old fellowship hall, and they had met me for the first time. And uh, that was what I heard. He's just a kid. I'm not just a kid anymore, am I? I mean, and, uh, but anyway, uh, sometimes it's hard to earn respect when you're younger. Yeah, you know, kind of, but, and, and, and if you're a little bit shy, and this was Timothy's position, he's a little bit shy, he's a little, he was a young person. But what holds everything together is the common share of God's grace mercy and peace. Verse 2, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the, the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what holds us all together. This is a key to who we are. It holds us together. Uh, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. And so we have that tie-in. It binds us as a family. It holds us together. We, commonly, we, we, we share in common God's grace, His marvelous grace. Remember that old hymn and it used to be in the green hymnal? Marvelous grace, His mercy, and His peace. So Timothy was in charge of leading the church in Ephesus in Paul's absence. <coughs> He asked him to do it, and particularly uh, with instructing the church and correcting those who are teaching false doctrine. And uh, so he's writing this letter, and he's trying to instruct him. To, he wants to reinforce some of the instruction that he'd give Timothy in person. And you can imagine, you know, Timothy's been, he's been taking notes. And, but now he's got it in writing again from uh, the Apostle Paul to instruct certain people who are teaching this different doctrine. You know a lot of people teach a different doctrine than what was originally given. You know? They really are. Once saved, always saved is kind of, you know, I don't know about that because later on we find here the last... Uh, by the way, I believe in the security of the believer. As long as you're believing, there's security in that. However... We, later on in the text, we find that there are two who shipwrecked their faith, and Hymenus and Alexander, who were handed over to Satan. That doesn't sound to me like they were, you know, forever and forever, uh, so that they would be taught not to blaspheme. Now, I think there's some security in, in belief, but when we stop believing, we can shipwreck our faith. Kind of skipping ahead there, but there's some false teaching in the world today. About the hope of the believer, the promise of the kingdom, who God is, who Jesus Christ is. There are certain truths that are central to Christian belief that we mustn't swerve from. And things mentioned, for example, in this context, the centrality of grace and mercy and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. And others, some were teaching something quite different from that. One of the false teachings about who God is today, who is God, you know? I mean, we get all kinds of answers. I think one of the best places to go to find out who God was is back to the Scriptures. What did the early church believe about who God was and who Jesus Christ was? Well, you know, you can go back and you can study the church creeds and, and all this. And, but 1 Corinthians chapter 8, 6 tells us this. this is what, if you wanted to to build upon a, uh, a creed of the early church. Here it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. Yet for us there is but one God, not three, one God, the Father from whom all things came, for whom we live. There is how many gods? There is one God. And there is one Lord. How many lords are there? There's one. And it's Jesus Christ through whom all things came and through whom we live. And later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5, here is another statement of faith of who the early church, what they believe about God and Jesus Christ. 
For there is, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. I know this is going to be a memory verse. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. Now we know that to be true because Jesus is the son of the living God, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, to the Virgin Mary. He walked this earth like mortal man. He had to be mortal because if he wasn't mortal, he could not die. And if he couldn't die, he, he couldn't die for our sins. And we'd still be left in our sins. And so there's one God, one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus who died on the cross, who was raised from the dead, first man to become immortal forever and ever, transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter in his sermon on, on the day of Pentecost, he, God raised him up from the dead and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God and being our mediator between God and man, the mediator, the man, Christ Jesus. That's pretty simple to me. I don't know about you, but 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, the key verse of what did the early church believe? What did they believe about God? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17, the one that we referred to earlier, now the King, eternally immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Yet on the other hand, we don't see that about Jesus Christ because He wasn't always eternal, He wasn't always immortal, He wasn't always invisible, and He wasn't part of some conception of three and one or any of that. But now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever, Amen. And then you see some of this in, in some of the early church creeds about the first, second century. And I believe in God Almighty and in Christ Jesus, His only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, who was crucified under Pontius Pilate and buried, and the third day rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, sit now at the right hand of the Father, which He shall come to judge the living and the dead, the forgiveness of sins and the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. But as you study church history and you see the creeds of the church, it changes dramatically to what we have today. The hope of the believer is in the resurrection. Jesus was transformed from mortal to immortality. The hope also is in when Jesus comes again and in the resurrection that we might be like Christ. And that hope is in the kingdom of God. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So looking at how Paul puts it, it seems that these people were putting, in this context, when he was writing about 1 Timothy chapter 1, they were putting a lot wrong emphasis on the law. There was a little bit of confusion in that way. Now law wasn't bad, but it was used when it's used in the right way, but he refers uh, to them concentrating on some myths and genealogy that suggests that it refers to certain Jewish myths, basically retold the book of Genesis, made out that Israel be the one and only people of God. And of course, Jesus spoke and it was preached by the early apostles that now the Gospels come to the Gentiles. And part of that uh, seems that they were promoting uh, things like celibacy and certain abs abs uh, abstinence from certain foods and as means of trying to be acceptable, kind of live by the law. And then the problem with this false teaching was that it encouraged speculation and meaningless talk rather than training in righteousness and faith. Now let's read uh, uh, verses, let's read verse 4. 
nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God which is by faith. Verse 5 is powerful. This is what this is written all about. Verse 5, but the goal of our instruction is for love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. And even today, some, some folks put so much emphasis upon the law that they lose sight of these things. Our instruction is for love and pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. And we have to ask ourselves, and a good test would be, do we spend our time on or put our energy into speculation and... and uh, caught up in, in uh, legalities and, or, or do they lead to love that comes from a pure heart uh, so as you're studying uh, the word of God we need to ask ourselves some of these questions is what is our faith doing for us I know some people are so caught up in the law that you know they become very judgmental to everyone else does your faith teach you that faith in God is the key to being right with God. There's a lot of false teaching in regard to prosperity faith. <laughs> Man, we live in America, isn't it great? And if I just pray hard enough and have enough faith, guess what? I'm going to get me a new car. Right? How many want a new car? I mean, there's churches that teach these kinds of things. And I want to tell you, these are false teachings. These rise to speculation. Uh, things that are not uh, true to the original gospel. And uh, uh, all you got to do is name it and claim it and boom, there it is. And, and yet I know a gospel where the apostle Paul and many of the apostles, they suffered greatly because of their faith. There's also the false teaching that all lifestyles are acceptable, even in the church. I mean, we're a church. We love everybody. We, we, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, it's okay. This is what they say. It's okay. Homosexual marriage is something that we are going to accept, and it's okay if uh, there are some churches that have homosexual pastors and priests and that sort of thing and yet I don't know but I think the Bible and the law speak of something differently of how we should conduct ourselves and how we should conduct the church now it's not to say that we aren't to love everybody and I, I know some of the converts that the Apostle Paul had were homosexuals because you read in 1st Corinthians chapter 9 verse I think it's verse Ten, or he says, some of you were some of these things. And, uh, but you've been washed, you've been sanctified uh, by the blood of Jesus Christ. So it's not that we don't love everybody, but, you know, there are certain things. The law teaches us something about the holiness of God and His laws. And so it, it, it seems the main point of bringing up these false writings is to prove that Christianity isn't the only way to God. And, uh, you know, every so often there are some books that come out and apocryphal writings, they spring up for, uh, after a few centuries. And, and, uh, but it seems like they try to undermine the Bible. And, and if they can undermine the Bible writings, uh, that pr to prove that Christianity, that there's a different way to God, then uh, they can just kind of dismiss the whole thing. The an uh, Angelical Church, they had an article that began something like this. I'll, I'll, sh I'll just show you how far off base some uh, churches have begun. This article began like this. Jesus came to show us the kingdom not to die for our sins. It goes on to conclude the kingdom is bigger than the church and bigger than Christianity. It must be these are kingdom people who are Buddhists, Muslim, Jews, Hindus, and atheists. 
You don't have to be a Christian to be a kingdom person, but you do have to be a kingdom person to be a Christian. You know, you, you read something like this and you begin to wonder what's left of the Christian gospel. <laughs> so the things that Paul was writing about the wolves in the church, the wolves are still in the church. They're still in Christianity. If Jesus didn't die for our sins, then why did He come in the first place? What sort of kingdom is it if He hasn't washed away our sins? And so the test that Paul puts forth uh, before us is uh, whether it's teaching promotes the glory of God and the good of the church. Verses 8 through 11, he stops, he clarifies his, his views on the law. And he says this, But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that the law is not made for the righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious. For the ungodly and sinners and for the unholy and the profane and those who kill their fathers or mothers for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to the sound teaching according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. So if you're talking to someone and you're battling this battle about some of the issues of the day of, of uh, what is a Christian and can a Christian be this or that and, and the, the subject of, I don't know, homosexuality comes up or any of these other things are mentioned here uh, come up and they say, well, that's just an Old Testament teaching. Well, I got news for you. There's some pretty good stuff in the New Testament as well. You know, I think about this text, one in 1 Corinthians, Romans chapter 1. Pretty good stuff to tell us what's right and what's wrong. And I don't know how a homosexual priest could come stand up here and preach some of these things and not understand what the Bible has to say. Amen. It just beats all I've ever seen. How, how in the world could you come up with that kind of philosophy and understanding of the Scriptures? It's unbelievable to me. So why did God give us the law? The Reformers suggested it came for three reasons to stop people from relying on their own efforts for righteousness. Works. The law shows how badly even the best of us fail. Luther says the idea of the, the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Secondly, it has a political or civil use in restraining wrongdoers so that we can live in peace. The fear of punishment is one of our great deterrents. Well, we've kind of messed that up, haven't we? In other words, a lot of times there's not much of a deterrent for some of the wrongdoing that people do. Thirdly, it points the way for believers to learn to live according to God's will. So it has its place. The law is good. The law is good. Well, here Paul's uh, concentrating on the first two purposes. He says the law is given for the lawless and the disobedient. Presumptually, it shows up, uh, in, up in their evil doing and, and leads them to repentance. But don't make the law your focus. Don't distort what the law has to say, he's basically saying. Uh, verses 12 through 17. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he has considered me faithful, putting me through service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, persecutor, violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving of all full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world. Here's a good one. Here's a good one. Trustworthy statement, verse 15, is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save who? Sinners. Among whom I am foremost all. And I want to tell you we're all, we've all been in Paul's place. Maybe we didn't hold the, the coats of those who were stoning Stephen. Maybe we, we've never carried letters to round up the Christians and have them thrown in the prisons. But we all are sinners before the eyes of God 
until we have been washed, sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus came to bring us grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and to cleanse us. And if you're any, teaching anything that leads you different from that, then it's probably not the true gospel. Verse 17, we already mentioned it. Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And then in verses 18 through 20, this command, I entrust you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you by them, you fight the good fight. And I want to tell you, there's a fight to be fought in society today. Amen. I mean, every day, Christians are, you're, you better put on your, your armor of God or you're going to get slaughtered out there in the world. Because there's a fight to be fought every single day. But some are going to fall by the wayside. And he mentions a couple of those, keeping faith and good conscience. Verse 19, which has have rejected, they suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Now how would you like to have your name mentioned in the Word of God for the last 2,000 years as having shipwrecked your faith? But here they are. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, who I have handed over to Satan so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. And we close out the chapters. We uh, conclude chapter 1 in Paul's letter to his son in the faith. Let's go back uh, this to conclude. Verse 5, But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. And that's what we should all strive for. That should be our goal as well. Let's turn to hymn number 281. Keep on believing.